I'm so glad that you've joined us today. My guest today is Tolian Chavijan. He's going to share a little bit about his story. And really today, our hope is to provide encouragement, perspective, and really some insight for you, the unfaithful spouse. If you're a betrayed spouse, I hope that you will listen today. I know that you will gain a lot. I know that you will understand more about the unfaithful spouse's journey. But if you're an unfaithful spouse, you've heard me do videos before, today is precisely for you. Our hope is that you can believe in yourself again one day, that you can continue to get back up. Because let me tell you, infidelity is one of the most paralyzing things that we do to ourselves. So I'm excited today. It's going to be a great opportunity to gain hope and really gain courage once again for your own journey. Tolian, I'm so glad that you've come. Thanks for having me. I appreciate your willingness to just kind of share your story. And I know that there's going to be many people that know your story. There's going to be many that have misconceptions about your story. So for our audience, why don't you just take a few minutes and share a little bit about your journey and your story up till now. I was born in a Christian home. I'm the middle of seven kids. I was born into a remarkable family. I loved almost everything about my upbringing. And I, at roughly the age of 14 or 15, for whatever reason, decided that I wanted to be on my own and do my own thing. And so that eventually led to me dropping out of high school when I was 16, getting kicked out of my house when I was 16. My parents said, listen, we love you and you will always be our son, but we have six other kids living under our roof. And if you're gonna continue living this way, you can't live this way here. At that point in time in my life, I thought that was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. No teachers breathing down my neck, no parents looking over my shoulder. I was finally free to do whatever I wanted to do. Uh, and lived very riotously for probably six years. And then that got really old really quick. And because of the foundation, the spiritual foundation my parents had laid for me when I was a kid, I knew what the answer was. I knew that I needed God to yeah. really help me and fix me. And so I uh, began a journey with God in a very intimate way wanted to tell the whole world about this amazingly gracious God who comes after bad people like me, who's unbelievably patient with train wrecks like me. And growing up in church and growing up in Christian schools, that wasn't really the God that I heard a lot about. I heard about a very demanding God, a God who was perpetually angry and annoyed with us because we kept screwing up. But the God that I experienced coming after me when I was at my worst was the God that I wanted to tell the whole world about. But I had dropped out of high school, never took SATs, got my GED, so I didn't have all of the, you know, sort of credentials I needed to get into college, but I really wanted to study and I wanted to learn and I wanted to grow. And so I eventually ended up going to a a university in Columbia, South Carolina, where I majored in philosophy. And when I was done with that, went on to a seminary to prepare for becoming a pastor. Um, and so that's what I did. And graduated from seminary, served on staff at a large church in Tennessee for a couple of years, and then moved back home to my hometown of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, to start a church at the request of a group of people. That eventually led to... Um, a church merger five years after I planted that church with a much larger, much more well-known church about 20 minutes down the road, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. And that was a very difficult transition. If you try to merge two families, right. two businesses, specifically two churches that are very culturally different, there's going to be some friction. And there certainly was for the first year or so. And then once that died down and the church started to really thrive, life for me became really fun. My professional life at that time skyrocketed. I was writing a book a year. I was traveling around the country, speaking at churches and conferences and other events. My sermons were broadcast worldwide on television. They were on the radio every week. You know, I was pastoring this large church. I mean, professionally speaking, I had almost everything that I could have ever dreamed of. And that went very, very well for a pretty decent amount of time. And then in 2015, it all came crashing down. My first marriage started to suffer in ways that are much clearer to me now than they were back then. 
but my first marriage started to suffer and rather than slowing down and giving it the attention that I needed, it ultimately ended in divorce in part because I was unfaithful to my first wife. And because I was a very public person in that, in sort of in the Christian world, the fall became extremely public. So it was all over the place. I mean, People Magazine, the, I was on the cover of the National Enquirer. You really know your life has hit rock bottom when you find yourself on the cover of the National Enquirer. But I come from a well-known family. My mom is the oldest of five children born to Billy and Ruth Graham, the evangelists. So that was my, those were my grandparents. And so because of my sort of public role and the famous family that I came from, my fall went viral. That began a process of serious depression for me. Um, I think I had, as a pastor, dealt with people who uh, had either experienced unfaithfulness because their spouse cheated on them, but also talking to the spouses who cheated and the kind of guilt and shame that they experience. Now I was the one experiencing the guilt and the shame and the regret of having not only betrayed my first wife in the way that I did, I was called to love her and cherish her and protect her and failed miserably in that regard, but also breaking up the world of my three kids. Uh, at the time, they were 20, 18, and 14, and all three of them were in uh, transitional periods in life. My oldest son had just gotten married and was expecting his first child. My middle child had just graduated high school and was starting college. My daughter was entering high school. So at pivotal times in their life, their sure and solid foundation exploded, and I had a large part to do with that. So dealing with the guilt of not only betraying my first wife and the shame that accompanies that, but also uh, the guilt and the shame that accompany looking at my three kids in the eyes and them looking at me, the one who was supposed to kind of keep it all together. I'm the one who made them feel safe. I was the anchor of our home. And for me to not only disappoint them, but so disrupt their lives in that way is something I still, four and a half years later, deal with every single day. I have a remarkable relationship with my children, thank God, and it never stopped being remarkable. We had to work through some things, but uh, so for that, I'm extremely grateful. Um, but I still deal with the pain of having uh, really disrupted their lives, blowing up their lives. And then, of course, the guilt and the shame and the regret that I experienced as a result of uh, failing those who put their trust in me as a leader, specifically a spiritual leader, someone that people would come to when they were in trouble. And, uh, you know, now I was uh, not just guilty of doing the same thing that a lot of the people I had ministered to over the years had done, but really failing them in that regard. And so, you know, I think it's, I do think it's super important when talking about infidelity and specifically infidelity in the context of marriage and family to recognize that both the one who is cheated on and the one who cheats, however that's defined, are both suffering in two, albeit very different ways. One is suffering from the pain of being betrayed by someone they trusted, and the other is suffering as a result of being the person who did the betraying, the guilt, the shame. And in my case, because it was so public, you know, the loss of reputation, the loss of opportunity, the loss of my job, the loss of my livelihood, in a sense, the loss of my calling, uh, in addition to the loss of my marriage and the loss of my family as it was. I finally came to the point where I simply accepted the fact that uh, this, in a sense, um, while my guilt and my shame in God's economy has been forever taken care of because of what Jesus has accomplished on my behalf, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the horizontal consequences of continuing to live life do not in some way, shape, or form reflect the guilt and the shame that still exists inside of me. And to be honest, rather than try to, I've tried in a thousand different ways to rid myself of it. And even though that seems to be an impossible task, 
I now, in a sense, see it as a gift, the struggle with those things as a gift, because it pushes me constantly back to God and the truth that He has announced, that I am forgiven because He has forgiven me. Whether I feel it or not, whether I ever feel capable of getting over my guilt, getting over my shame, trying to recover some sense of normalcy about life, uh, to know that God has accepted me, He has approved of me, that even in my worst moments, in my darkest seasons, He never bailed on me, and that the stamp of forgiven forever is on my forehead because of what Jesus has done, is what helps me get through those moments, those days, those weeks or months where the guilt and shame seem overwhelming. And I think as the general consensus, you know, eyes outside looking in, there's this idea that, well, you know, he just probably picked up and moved on and and (laughs) rolled on down the road, right? And didn't feel any Mm self-hatred, didn't feel any, you know, feeling of worthlessness Mm -hmm. and feeling like God had washed you know, his hands of you. I mean, in those dark moments mm-hmm. when when you everything is lost, right? Everything that we were at some level relying upon, mm-hmm. the fame, the traveling that were so important that sometimes we become applause addicts, right? Mm-hmm. And we just love the applause sure. of the of a of people and our insecurities. Mm-hmm. What do you say to the unfaithful spouse who you know, maybe they haven't lost as much of the external stuff like mm-hmm. you did. They their names weren't in the paper, they weren't all over the media. Mm-hmm. But how do you help the unfaithful who's wallowing in this, man, can I, am I ever, maybe they looked into their eyes of their kids and their kids said, I don't want anything to yeah, do with you. Right. What do you say to the unfaithful that's just wallowing in that, that horrendous pit of, am I ever going to have another good day again? Yeah. I mean, yeah. what's your thoughts yeah, for that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, there is not one answer to that question for everybody. Right. Because everybody's experience of guilt and shame and the reasons why they're experiencing guilt and shame are unique to them and different. Each family dynamic is different. I can say this though, one of the things that I learned in the process of recovery from everything that happened was that you don't really know what it is you're depending on to make life worth living until those things are gone. In my case, um, you know, the loss of my marriage, the loss of my family, at least as a unit, the way that it had always been, the loss of my many, many friendships, uh, the loss of my livelihood, and in a sense, my calling, the way I understood it and the way I felt it my entire adult life, the loss of money, financial stability, uh, the loss of hope, all of those things um, really, not only were those things incredibly painful, but they catapulted me into a massive identity crisis Right. at 42 years old mm-hmm. at the time. I didn't realize it then, but I had put so much of my identity in those things and in those people. And when those things and those people were gone, I was 42 years old and I had no idea who in the hell I was. I was spinning, spinning. I was in spin cycle. I had never experienced depression, as far as I can remember, Mm -hmm. a day in my life, ever. Um, I've just always been a people person, an extrovert. I've always loved the sights and sounds and smells of life. I've never been a despairing kind of person. I've never been melancholic or prone to depression. And for the first time in my life at 42, I couldn't get out of bed. I didn't want to get out of bed. I absolutely believed life was over. I was convinced, absolutely convinced that my best days were behind me, that I would never be happy again, that I would never experience joy and peace the way that I had enjoyed it for so long. To me, life was over. And it was no longer about enjoying life. It was about surviving this hour, surviving this day, surviving this week. Anybody who's out there who has experienced something similar to what I went through knows that, you know, minutes feel like hours and hours feel like days and days feel like weeks and weeks feel like months. I mean, life seems to move so slow. And one of the things that was so difficult for me was life goes on for other people. Right. It was amazing to me how I would be driving in my car and stop at a red light, for instance, 
and I'm just dying inside. You know, I feel totally alone. I feel disgusting. Uh, I feel like everything I had worked for and everything I had built is now gone because of something I did. I was dealing with self-hatred. I was dealing with all sorts of things. Just the, the so many deaths that I experienced, death of a marriage, death of a family, death of a life, really, in all of its details. And I would look over at the person next to me, for instance, sitting in their car at the red light, and I would think, I don't know what this person's going through, but their life has got to be so much better than mine. Death for the first time seemed preferable to life. And there was not a day, not one day that went by for over a year where I did not at some point in time during the day contemplate killing myself, which I had never experienced before. Those thoughts had never crossed my mind before. So I was in a, I was in a bad way and I was in bad shape. Uh, and there really is in some sense no moving on. I mean, depending on how you define moving on, life does not go on as if it didn't happen. You know, it life goes on with the fact that it did happen and learning what life now looks like for me, accepting the death of my former life uh, and accepting the new life that God had for me was an incredibly painful transition. I did not want to let go. There were so many things about my former life that I was trying to salvage, so many things I was trying to resurrect in my own power, so many things that were so comforting and so familiar to me, and I didn't want to let it go. But in order for me to fully embrace what God had for me today, I had to let go of a yesterday that was never coming back. And that for me was one of the most painful parts of the entire process of recovery. So for the person who wonders, will I ever be happy again? Will I ever experience joy again? Will life ever feel good to me again? The only answer that I can give to that is uh, it depends. I know that if I had continued trying in my own power, um, to make things better, it would have only gotten worse. And I did that for a while. For the first year after uh, my marriage fell apart, I did everything I could to salvage what I had been losing or what I had already lost. And so I was manipulating the narrative. I was not telling the whole truth to the people around me. I was playing the victim. I would confess my sin enough to satisfy the person listening to me, but it was really an attempt just to get that person on my side so that I could get on with life. Right. If I could build a loyal tribe of people around me and try to salvage some of the family members and some of the friends that I felt like I was losing, then I could sort of go on. Trying to salvage what God was putting to death, trying to salvage that in my own power only made it worse. It was when I finally said, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. Like I, I'm, I'm dead to the things that were in the past, not because I wanted to be, but because there was no hope for ever getting any of that stuff back. And that's when God, a year afterwards, uh, is when God really started his deconstructing work in me. And I can say now that I am a much more free man than I was before. And I thought I was free before. Suffering has a way of stripping you from those things that you unconsciously depend on to make life worth living and exposing, in many ways, the idolatry of our own hearts. And it has a way of getting us to the place where the only answer is Jesus plus nothing equals everything, and that everything minus Jesus equals nothing. And when we arrive at that place, which is a long, slow, and incredibly painful process, uh, it's extremely freeing. And I think you said something that's very key is that, you know, when, when we are faced with the consequences of our own choices, it's one thing when we can blame somebody else, right? We'll blame our parents, we'll blame our employer. There's, there's always someone to blame. But when you're faced with the reality of, wait a minute, wait a minute, I've done this to myself. Mm -hmm. And... I guess my question would be, what got you out of bed? 
I mean, what what got you to the point where you were living again? Because I think for me, I know in my own shame, it was kind of like, look, I've lost everything. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm about to lose Samantha and my kids. I'm mm-hmm. trying desperately. But everything that I once thought was the essence of my life and for those that come from faith, my calling, what I mm-hmm. felt like God had called me to do, if you don't come from faith, your purpose. I mean, what you right. feel like, this is what I'm meant to do. Right. And now it's all disintegrating in your hands. Mm-hmm. What was it that, that caused you to say, look, I mean, for me, it was kind of like, I've got to live again. And I remember there was a night where I did call the suicide hotline and I thought about ending it all. The problem was to reach across and, and get my phone, there was a picture of my kids. Mm-hmm. And that was what kept me, me going. Me too. What was it? If it was your kids, great, but why don't you share a little bit about what it was that said, you know what, I've yeah. got to live. Yeah. Like maybe I never return to the pulpit. Yeah. Maybe I never right, do any of those right, things. Right. But, Which I didn't care about at the time. But I have right. life ahead of me. So yeah. what was it for you? You know, man, gosh, um, first of all, let me say that the the reason, at, and I think I can say this um, exhaustively, the only reason I did not end my life at that point was because of my kids. I had put them through so much already, and there was no way that I could imagine putting them through more. But in terms of what got me out of bed, I feel very good saying, I don't know. And I think that's liberating for people because A, you don't have to know. Um, I look, I honestly, I was telling someone this a couple months ago, I look at where I was four and a half years ago and where I am now. And while I can talk in depth about the recovery process and the people that God brought into my life that really helped me and gave me some much needed perspective in the crucible of ache as I was walking through the valley of the shadow of death, at the same time, I look at where I was and where I am and the only explanation in terms of how I got from here to here is God picked me up and brought me here. That is it. And I just finished preaching a sermon in North Carolina this past week at a church. And I said this, that the only reason I am alive today and standing in front of you is not because in my darkest moments, I held on to God. It's because in my darkest moments, he held on to me. That is it. I mean, I, I would love to be able to give some, you know, sort of checklist like, okay, now listen, if you're feeling the way I was in, two, when I, in 2015, here are the five things that I did right. to ensure that I would get from here to here. I have no such checklist. I have so much of those four and a half years were a blur to me. And I just think sometimes that's the way God works. I mean, honestly, I mean, I know that there are, Uh, And I have a lot of friends who are uh, Christians of faith and friends who aren't. It doesn't matter what their background is. I, I tell them all, I say, I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me and say that there is no way I could have ever gotten from here to here unless God was the one who brought me there. There is no way. And, you know, I mean, I tried a whole bunch of things. I think for me, part of it was... The harder I tried to fix myself, the worse I got. Because that was the problem. That's what, that's what led me to the problem in the first place, was trying to do everything on my own, make it on my own, make uh, whatever the case may be, satisfy myself on my own, find happiness on my own, filling voids on my own. All of that stuff is what led me to my crash and burn. To revert back to that mode of operation to get me out of it, would have been a fool's errand. And I tried it for a while and it proved to be a fool's errand. There is light at the end of the tunnel and there is hope uh, for those who have, in a sense, died to live again. And God is the source of that hope. He has been for me. And we talked about this off camera. I know for me, there was a way that I preached before my complete disaster, bankrupt failure. And there was a way that I preached after. Mm -hmm. There was a sense in me that was kind of like, man, could God ever really use me again? And I remember at that time, my mentor said, you know, God will be able to use you better than he ever has before because now you know what it's like to fail. Right. Now you know what it's like at rock bottom. Tell me about your message maybe before 
and now after kind of this resurrection of who you are and this genuine recalibration, if you will, of who you are as a man. I mean, talk about what it was and what it is now. Interestingly, and I told you this off camera, the message that I preach now is no different from the message that I preached before. The difference is in where it's coming from. A while back, my wife, Stacy, made a, a very helpful distinction for me. She said, you know, you, your ministry before uh, was marked by great sympathy for the sinner and the struggler and the person who was, you know, just dealing with the brokenness of life. There was a lot of sympathy. She said, now when I listen to you, there isn't simply sympathy, but there's empathy. And she said, the difference is because now you, because you've been where they are, you actually know how they feel. You're not just sympathizing with them because you feel bad for where they are. You're empathizing with them because you've been exactly where they are. And I think that's true. So I think it's, I think it's coming from a different place. Um, I believed it before. I really believe it now, if that makes sense. You know, I do think that um, success is far more dangerous than failure. Uh, One of the things that God uses failure to do, at least he did in my life, uh, is to protect me from locating my identity in my success, which can be very enslaving when you do that, because now your worth and your value and your significance is directly tied to your performance. If you succeed, you're a success. If you fail, you're a failure. Well, that's a terrible way to live. When your identity is anchored in something more sure than your performance, namely God's performance for you, it's very liberating. So um, I would say that I am probably a more free preacher now. I mean, I took a lot of time off. So I didn't just go from, you know, crashing and burning to, I mean, I took... The first year, like I mentioned, was spent trying to salvage everything. The second year, after I realized that wasn't going to happen, God had shut those doors. The second year was spent in just recovery. I uh, talk about that year as being my year of spiritual, emotional, and mental detox and rehab. And then the following year uh, was spent kind of reflecting, and I started getting some speaking invitations, and I would travel and speak and tell my story very openly, very honestly very transparently, and as a result of that, we started hearing from people all over the world about their own crash and burn stories. And I don't know, it, 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 it always, it sucks, to be honest, to stand up in front of people or to sit on an interview like this or write about this and publish it. It's very, it's not easy to talk about the fact that I cheated on my first wife. It's embarrassing. It sucks to say that. I get uncomfortable every time I talk about it. It's embarrassing. It's shameful. Um, It's never fun standing up and telling people how duplicitous and deceitful I was. I can't stand that. But I don't know of any other way to demonstrate how good God is unless I'm able to freely express how bad I am. It is His grace and His love and His mercy that runs downhill and meets us at the bottom in the darkest places. That was the flavor of my ministry before. It's the flavor of my ministry now, Um, but it's just coming from a heart that believes it more now than ever. And if that isn't true, you know, then I'd I'd be screwed. (laughs) We both would, absolutely. You know, my final question is, being a pastor, Just a newly, I just became a pastor again, as a matter of fact. I was telling you off camera. uh, About, oh, I don't know, three weeks ago, my wife and I launched a church uh, in just north of West Palm Beach, Florida, which is about 45 minutes north of my hometown in Fort Lauderdale. A group of people came to us almost a year ago and asked if we would consider planting a church. And I was intrigued, but very reluctant I didn't want to get back into it. And I knew that if I did, I was going to get crucified (laughs) by people for even daring to go back into pastoral ministry after everything I had done. So I was very tentative, wasn't sure. Uh, But God's call through other people 
uh, counselors, advisors, whatever, was very, very clear. And so we ended up making the move. So I've just started. I'm kind of getting my feet wet again, preaching every week. It's been four and a half years since I've had to prepare sermons every week. So all of this stuff is very relevant to me because I'm sort of, you know, going, okay, what is this? Who am I going to be now yeah. as a preacher? I know what I was before, but the new guy hasn't had to prepare sermons and preach sermons every week and pastor a church. What's that going to look like? So far, so good. Well, I think, you know, the ability to relate to those mm-hmm. that have been in this dark place of hopelessness. I think it was T.D. Jakes that says, if you preach to the hurts of the people, you'll never lack for an audience. Right. And now you're able to relate in a new way. If you were to take two minutes and just look into the camera and, and reach out to that unfaithful who mm-hmm. maybe they're a week, a month, Maybe they're a year in and can't seem to get out of bed, Mm. can't even begin to think that even if they hear your story and the the popularity, the success, I mean, all of the accolades, but even for them, there's this point where they feel, you know, because pain is so blinding. Mm -hmm. We can kind of think, oh, that worked for him. It's not going to work for Mm -hmm. me. Or big time. I'm just, I'm different. I I can't do it like he did. I'm not, you know, attractive and strong and all of that energy. I don't have that. You know, we always love to make ourselves the exception. Yes, and I did. Take two minutes, encourage them. What would you say to them? How would you help them breathe purpose and life and meaning again? Man, that is such a tough question. My heart goes out to all of them um, because I know what that feels like. I had a whole bunch of reasons to make myself the exception. And in doing that, I think we we shortchange what God has always promised to do. I think we have this impression that God works with good and clean people. The problem with that is there's no such thing as a good and clean person. God loves and uses bad and weak people who fail because there aren't any other kinds of people. The only thing I could say to them is God loves you. Um, He has not forgotten about you. One of my mentors said to me at my worst moment, which I think is relevant for everybody to hear, that the suffering you are going through is God's way of pushing you into a freedom from false versions of what you were. And that has proven true to me. You know, I have, I'm, I'm so much more free now than I was before. That's the fruit of the suffering um, that I have gone through. My identity is, I, I'm more self-aware. My identity is uh, more squarely anchored, not in what I do or who I am, but in what God has done for me and in who He is Nothing, the worst case of infidelity cannot, I don't care how guilty you are, I don't care what a, you know, what a train wreck you are, the worst cases of infidelity cannot separate you from God's love, period. Other people will count your sins against you, right. you will count your sins against you, but God promises to never count our sins against us. And that has been my hope. I mean, my, my faith has been awakened as a result of this because I've seen God tangibly move. This isn't just some fairy in the sky, fairy tale kind of thing for me. I mean, I'd be dead if it wasn't for His grace imposing itself into my life. I mean, His his love is mugging in nature and I'm so glad for that. I mean, He comes to us when we are at our worst Uh, He gives us his best when we are at our worst. And um, so, um, you know, as much as I would love to say, keep going, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, maybe the best thing to do is just completely give up and see what God does. I know that you wouldn't do it, but take a minute. Tell them about your church one more time, where it's located, where they can find it. So we are, uh, the name of our church is The Sanctuary. The sanctuary, our church, um, exists for people who are broken and know it, people who deal with the kind of guilt and shame and regret from just being a broken person, living in a broken world with other broken people. We believe uh, that it's a safe place to tell the truth about yourself without fear of rejection. 
because of what we're saying, the kinds of people who are coming are people like you and me and, you know, other humans right. who know what it's like to deal with failure, whether their own or someone else's. Thanks for coming in. You've been Thanks a gift. Thanks for having me. Thank I appreciate you. you. Thanks.